You know, we grew up very poor. My right. dad did everything, so my mom had to make a, a clear cut decision. <laughs> Stamps. A lot of you kind of wish on your own kids you, that, that they'll never have to feel something like that. And, you know, my so my brother always instilled in me, hey, you know, hard work pays off. So I think that's kind of led up to my adulthood. If you, if you just work hard and put your head down, that, that and that started when I was a town resident. Uh, well, I guess, I guess a piece of advice would be, you know, don't get so emotional about your deals. And that's something which I'm still telling myself. You do, you do, yeah. What's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of Real Talk. Today I'm extremely happy, stoked, uh, long awaited guest, my friend, my good friend, one of the top of New York City people that I know, uh, whether it's a broker or a personality or a friend or an acquaintance or a person that you have in your life, Mr. Sean Hughes. Sean and I met about, Hi, thank you for coming. Sean and I met about, at, at, uh, at a, at a uh, uh, then a very, very small real estate company called Town Real Estate. Sean was probably the first, one of the first five agents that joined the company. Uh, we quickly became good friends. Uh, Sean and I essentially uh, grew our careers together around the same time. Obviously, totally different trajectory. Sean is extremely successful. I'm just still kind of uh, in the middle of the road trying to get along here and, and sludgy slugging along into not the case. today's little real estate, a uh, COVID real estate market. But in any event, Sean is chock full of stories a wealth of knowledge in his own right. Just to give you a little bit of a background with him, a very modest kid. He uh, born and raised in Hackensack, New Jersey. He grew up between Hackensack and Sea Caucus, New Jersey. Uh, he's done many, many small jobs in, in, around uh, the, the New York area. He's waited tables at a place called Cafe Spice, uh, where uh, his first uh, table that he waited on was uh, a couple, a vegetarian couple. He didn't know what the, he couldn't hear what they wanted to order. So they brought him, he brought him a, 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 a vegan or a, I'm sorry, it was a lamb dish. Lamb, lamb vindaloo. A lamb vindaloo. Uh, he's been a park bar uh, and he's forayed into real estate as um, he was a, he started out as a driver with, uh, you were driving Wendy Maitland around at one point, right? Yeah, so talk a little bit about that. Very excited, and uh, yeah, Sean is. This is going to be a great episode. So uh, enjoy, Sean. Welcome. Thank you, Todd, for having me. Sorry it took so long <laughs> to get to this point, and even still, we're not in person. But you know, it's good to see you, man. You are a big deal, and I appreciate your time more than anything else. <laughs> a big deal in my mind, and maybe your mind. But that's about it. And my one to three year old, and that's about it. Listen, you have you have a lot of things going on. Oh yeah, speaking of Sean, you currently live uh, near the Jersey Shore, correct? Yes. yes. With your wife, beautiful wife Nikki, tell her I said hello. Yes. And beautiful. two beautiful daughters, Kai and Elsa. No, one is a boy. Oh, sorry, one is a boy. With two beautiful children, one yeah. Kai, yeah, young Elsa, Kai. Elsa is three, soon to be four, and Kai is one and a half, and just rip roaring for everything right now. So it's, it's a fun, fun and quite bizarre time, as I'm sure a lot of parents out there can agree with that, you know, you're trying to work and still balance out being, being a parent while they're at home screaming. How, how, how are raising the kids in Jersey? It's great. I mean, um, besides them having to say that I'm from Jersey one day, besides <laughs> that, everything's good. Uh, no, it's fun. I mean, you know, I am from New Jersey, from North Jersey. I've always associated with kind of the New York metro area because I grew up right from my backyard. I was looking at the Empire State Building and always had a love for buildings, you know, since I was a kid, just staring at it. And now going from Manhattan to Jersey City, we now live in Red Bank, New Jersey, uh, which is, you know, four miles from the beach, which we absolutely love because our kids get to grow up by the beach, but still an hour away from Manhattan. So we kind of have the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I, I, especially during this pandemic, it's been it's been kind of nice to have more space. Sure, sure. And so, in speaking of pandemic, I mean, how have you guys been surviving out there? Are, are I mean, right now we're basically tomorrow's October first. I mean, are you guys in New Jersey where you are? 
are the restaurants open? Are the schools fully open? Are the bars out open? Are you on the beach all the time? I mean, what's going on? I don't know. I've been out of my house in 17 months. <laughs> no, I, um, you know, Jersey's, it's a little bit different, I have to say here, because when I go to Manhattan, still, you know, I still work, and we can get to this later, but I still am a broker with Compass, obviously, in New York. Uh, but I'm also now have my license in New Jersey, which I've had for a while. But I have started my business here and kind of focusing on both based mm -hmm. on where the current state of the market is. And to answer your question, it's when you go to Manhattan, everybody there is wearing a mask. But I feel like down, down where I live, people just aren't. So, <laughs> and, and, and recently, we have a spike now in Monmouth County where I live. Is that right? right? It's at a rate that it hasn't been in months. So it's kind of... It's kind of a shame that people still are not taking it as serious as they as they should, but that's a whole different it's a whole different story. Right, right, interesting. Well, so so let's let's take it back to the beginning since we're all here. And it's our first podcast together. Uh, we want to give the audience an, a background of who you are, how you got here, what you're you know what what you had to do to get to where you are today. Because I know you have a lot of interesting stories. You know, growing up in Hackensack, New Jersey, like, what were you like as a kid? Pretty awkward. No, I was, I was, uh, no, pretty much, pretty much the way I am now. I, I, I was always, always kidding around. All good looking, handsome. I mean, look at this hair. I mean, things are really starting to grow out here. So, um, I, I mean, I don't know how deep we want to go into this, but you know, well, I thought, you want. really? Oh yeah. Anybody back there? No. Um, no, I felt like I was always kidding, trying to hide things. You know, I was very, very probably uh, insecure mm -hmm. uh, because of just, you know, my past and how I grew up, not having a dad, you know, a lot of insecurities and probably still have the same like pattern of joking around because of that. I don't really feel you kind that of have a relationship with your dad. I know we talked about this in the past. You kind of have a relationship with your dad now as an adult, right? No, my dad passed away. Oh, he did. Uh, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, Talk. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. No, it's it's interesting that you know the way the way it kind of came around is we didn't talk at all. My dad left when I was two weeks old. Right. And my mom basically, you know, she had two kids already, and then I was just born, and my dad took everything and basically fled. Mm -hmm. Never showed up to court, and um, you know, didn't grow up with it. He he just basically took off. And, you know, I had the choice of, you know, as a grown man to say, hey, you know, do I ever, do I want to just shun him out and say, you know, hell with him and have this, this idea of, you know, who, because you always have an idea of who this person is. And I said, you know what, I felt it was important for me to one day be a father to meet this guy, which is right. something I needed to do personally. So my now wife, when, when she was, when we were dating, went with me i had my buddy who was who was uh, a cop at the time right track him yeah. down okay. and find him i and, remember uh, and, yeah i remember you were talking yeah, it was, yeah. it was uh, you know very it was very intense to say the least and uh you know i don't know how far you want me to go into the story but uh as, as you like yeah i ended up i ended up knocking on he was he was out of florida and but visiting in new jersey i got down to the specifics of where he was mm -hmm. knocked on the door met this girl talked to her for 20 minutes and said, I don't want to freak you out, but I'm your half brother. And, uh, you know, I have two other half brothers and half sisters that I don't talk to. Now I talk to her um, and then met up with my dad shortly after, about a week after. And it was, you know, it's not like what you see in, in Oprah, at least it wasn't for me where, you know, you hug him and say, I, I missed you my whole life. It was just sort of, you were a stranger to me. And, and you know, we just kind of talked and, and then things kind of unraveled from there. To, to, to be honest, it was kind of, a bizarre situation because he tried to take his own life and then things got kind of spiraled out of control from there for him. Right. Well, did, did you have a learning experience from that, from that encounter, that, that whole ordeal that yeah. he went through? Yeah. Um, you kind of learn, at least for me, you'll learn that, you know, life is way too short to not just forgive. Right. Fun. You know, and I think it, it was, for me, it was, it was a sense of like, a, a, you know, a portion of my life that I think needed to be healed mm -hmm. because there was never something that, you know, my older brother could say, or, you know, my mom or, you know, it gets me a little emotional. 
it's, it's all good. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty you know, I didn't expect to talk about this. <laughs> as a kid, though, you know, I mean, we, we obviously, you know, we're going to lead up to who you are today. And obviously the, the past really paints a picture of who we all are sure. as, as grown adults. You know, what, what do you think were some of the things that uh, other things impacted you as, as growing up as a kid in Hackensack uh, to who you are today outside of obviously your, you know, your father not being present, but I know your mom, you, you had to maybe grow up a little bit faster because you were, you know, you, you had to be almost the man of the house at a younger age. My brother was the man of the house. You know, I have an older brother who was a, a right. phenomenal example. He always, you know, put in me and instilled in me that hard work pays off. You know, since I was a very young kid, I just remember, you know, I always had a lot of jobs, which which a portion of me was embarrassed because my friends who had both parents or or just more money than me, you know, we grew up very poor. My right. dad did everything. So my mom had to make a, a clear cut decision of, hey, do I do I want to raise three kids? And unfortunately, you know, not unfortunately, that thank God the system's there to help people. You know, I grew up on welfare, you know, I grew up on food stamps, a lot of things that young kids don't have an understanding where as you get to reach a certain age and you see your, your other friends having more than you or having, you know, uh, not having to use food stamps. So there are things that just when you're growing up and now I see it with my own kids that I had to deal with that, you know, you, you kind of wish on your own kids you, that, that they'll never have to deal with something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, so my brother always instilled in me, hey, you know, hard work pays off. So I think that's kind of led up to my adulthood where, that's always the way it is, you know, and I, and I kind of, you know, at, at times everybody struggles with that. You kind of, you kind of have moments in your life where you kind of get lazy or you don't work hard. And I've always found that, Hey, if you, if you just work hard and put your head down that, that, and that started when I was a town residential too, where I kind of made that decision as well and really kind of sunk my feet into, into uh, sunk my teeth into real estate. Right. So, so th th let's just say you, 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 you graduated high school. Uh, you know, what, up, right up to that point, you're 17, 18 years old. What were you thinking as far as future was concerned? Did you have a plan to go into something immediately or did you feel like you were trying to still find yourself? Did you have a direction? I mean, not many young adults. Uh, I, mean, I told my brother, <clears throat> I hated school. You know, I, I always felt awkward. Uh, Why was that? Uh, I felt awkward. I, I have, uh, you know, learning disability. Um, you know, I... I've never I've probably told probably 10 people this in my life. I might as well say it now. I'm, I'm dyslexic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is something I still struggle with. Um, man, this is, whew, that's getting deep. And then deep today. Uh, you know, and that sucked. It sucked for me. It really sucked because, um, you know, I'm older. I'll be 44 in a few weeks. So when I was really young, they didn't know how to deal with any of this. And there were teachers who nowadays would have lawsuits against them because they were really mean to me. Uh, it was bizarre. The things uh, that I look back and they said to me to, to have for, for, you know, for kids back then to have to struggle with, you know, I'm just happy to see that, that kids nowadays at least do have outlets. I still think not enough, but, um, but my, so, so going back to your question about my plan was, you know, I didn't like school. So, yeah. so I told my brother, I said, you know, I want to go to the Marines and I want to be a New Jersey state trooper. Oh, and my brother said, you're not, you're not going to the Marines. You're crazy. And, and, uh, I always wanted to be a New Jersey state trooper, right? Something I was, I don't know why to this day, I'm not joking. I still have this like underlying passion to be a cop, <laughs> really, really bizarre. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, um, I'm, I'm glad it didn't happen because all things lead to where I am now and I have my kids and it's, and it's, but you know, I chose a different path. So what did you do right after, right out of uh, high school? When, what, what what did you? Already... Well, I got accepted to a couple of colleges, and my brother said, "Well, look, if you don't know what you want, don't spend the money on college." Yeah. So I chose to go to a community college and spend less to see if I liked it, and I ended up really enjoying it and taking theater classes. Oh. I started doing some acting, and and so like my my life took a lot of weird turns that like not weird. I feel like people kind of take take different different roadmaps, but this is kind of like I went from all different steps and I was kind of all over the place, but acting is so you acting is so you that is, it was, and I had a blast doing it. And then, and then I, I uh, applied to Stella Adler conservatory, uh -huh. got in and I went there. Um, and then from there, you know, did some, some modeling, <laughs> which I'm always embarrassed to say because I gained so much weight and I'm balding and people are like, 
it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen some of your your modeling photos. I mean, yeah, you you look like uh, you 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 look like a you were so skinny. You kind of look like a uh, like almost Gumby, like a hot Gumby. <laughs> I was 170 pounds. I, I remember going to IMG models and they signed me up. Oh, was, model for IMG. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. My book is still with IMG. And, and I remember them saying, you know, can you lose weight? And I'm like, I'm 170 pounds. because <laughs> I was going to Milan for fashion week. And I was like, I can't, I can't lose any more weight. But, uh, but yeah, so then I did that for a while and then moved to LA and did acting there. But never, never really made, I did like a couple of very small things, but never really kind of, I always had this fear of succeeding. So, you know, that's kind of why I feel like I didn't stay in LA and stay the course on acting. I had a real passion for it. And I think a lot of things I do, I do have a real passion for. Right. I always, I always had this fear of succeeding. And I remember a teacher at Stella Adler told me that. He's like, you know, you're right at the edge of the diving board, but like you don't want to jump. And I don't know why. And I said, you know, probably goes back to the, to the you know, <laughs> the growing up with you know, the insecurities again, going back to who you are as a little kid. Your childhood, right. right. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, so I moved back from LA and then kind of started this other chapter of my life. So I really had these like really thick chapters of my life and kind of went down these different roads and, and they all kind of. How long did you end up staying in LA for? Only about a year. Mm -hmm. And you, you had to come back for a reason, no? Yeah, my family. I'm very close to my family. That's right. For me, I felt like, you know, if I'm really going to do this and, and really have a shot at it, you know, I'd probably end up out here because everything's in Los Angeles and um, I miss my family too much. I remember coming back to Manhattan and going out with my friends and seeing my brother and staying with my mom and saying, oh man, I, I miss this. Right. I, went back, I flew back there and I told my roommate, uh, listen, I'm paying you for the next three months rent. And I, I called my agent out there um, and I was with Innovative Artists and they said, uh, I said, I'm going to leave in a few months. She said, oh, okay, well, maybe you could go back to New York. And I said, you know what, I'm going to leave next week. And about an hour later, I called her and said, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> so that's just, I mean, you know, you know the way I am. I just sort of jump and I, I just go. So I jumped in my car and my buddy said, I'll meet you out there. We could drive cross country. I said, no. Nah. I, I wanted to do it on my own. I drove cross country and it was like an experience that I'll never forget. It was, it was just really cool experience, you know, staying in these raunchy motels that smelled like cigarettes when you woke up and, but just kind of like learning about yourself and kind of like the next chapter of your life. So it was, right. it was fun. Right. Did, were you nervous coming back, not knowing what you're about to do or 4 a into? No, not really. I'm still nervous. nervous right now. <laughs> I'm always nervous. I'm always nervous. The answer to that. Um, I always have this anxious feeling just about the next step of my life. Right. So yes, the answer is yes. I was very nervous. Okay. All right. Um, so so now you're now you're back in New York City. You spent your time in LA. You you're refreshed. You self. Uh, yeah. You try to self identify yourself. I mean, I, I know I know everything is a process here, but uh, what 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 were you what were your plans? What did you start doing when you were back in New York City? Same, same acting, innovative artists, New York, and you know, still kind of put my head down, tried to do some things, but there was always a side of me that wanted to do something else. Yeah, the whole, the whole acting, you know, it, it was the the whole side of it where the audition process happened and the whole world of acting just it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was just more about the work, and, and there was just a lot, whole other side of it that just wasn't me. So you know, as I was doing that, started waiting tables at another place in New York called Diner 24 on the corner of 8th Avenue and 15th Street, which is now a Jamba Juice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. And, um, you know, ended up becoming like a, a very silent partner there with, with one of the owners who's still a friend of mine. And um, yeah, from there I was bartending at Merck Bar. And then I, I don't know, if, I think, you know, I ended up owning a bar as well. Yep. Merck Bar, Bar, classic. Talk about that. Merck Bar was fun. I mean, Merck Mer Mercer and Houston. Mercer between Prince and Houston. And that was, I feel like, a time of the very tail end of a piece of New York that doesn't really exist anymore in that area. Yeah. You know, there was, there was actually a bar there, a place for people to hang out and go and hang out there, uh, you know, on a Saturday afternoon or go there at four o'clock 
you know, on a, on a, on a Thursday and hang out till two in the morning. It was just, yeah. you know, and that and bar it was bumping. I mean, it was yeah, not the owner, you know, he's just got to figure it out. He knows that business and he just, the way he started that bar and the way like it, it kept going for that many years. Yeah. Phenomenal. Unbelievable. I remember, I remember going there many times in my mid twenties, mid twenties. Yeah probably before I even met you and that, I mean, that bar was so much fun and it was right next to Mercer kitchen, which is still there. And it was lure, lure fish bar was even there. Lure fish bar. Lure fish bar. Yeah. That's well, what lure I, fish bar used to be. Um, you see uh, something else. Yeah. I see, I see something else. What was it? Canteen? Was it canteen? I think canteen. it was canteen. They had, they had a fire. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's so lure, right. Lure fish bar is also the same owners as Merc bar. Lure Fish Bar is the same. Oh, it is. I didn't know that. Yeah, he has, he has quite a few places. Lure Fish Bar, and he has another place. I'm oh, they're doing now. well. They're yeah, doing he's, got, he's got quite a few places. So, yeah, Lure's a good, good spot to go to. Yeah, but you have you have a lot of good memories at Merck Bar, huh? Yeah, great memories. And, of course, I took the, the, the choice of saying, hey, I'm going to start my own bar, which is, like, very, very difficult. I would never want to go down that road again. I met you. You had already owned the bar. Ooh, yes. You were already successful. Oh, it's exhausting thinking about it. What's that? What happened to that bar? And how did you get into that, by the way? Uh, just because, you know, I, I was bartending and I said, I guess like every bartender secretly wants to own a bar. So I had a couple of investors on board and I brought one of my buddies on board and said, you know, let's, let's go for it. And we kept looking at spaces. We found one space on, on the Bowery, uh -huh. which is a place I really, Bowery really and wanted what? Uh, between Houston and Prince as well. Oh, you can't lose there. It was the old place that Lenny Kravitz owned. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I was like, man, I'm dying to to get this. But you know, you know, my buddy Teddy, he was a he was a chef. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was going to do tapas he there. We were at, uh, Teddy worked at the Grand Central spot. No, it was one of the places he worked. Yeah, so you know, we had to get signed petitions, and we went to a community board meeting. Went there just naive, and I was so excited. Community board shut us down. You know, they were like, no, 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 this is going to be too noisy. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you so much. You know, and, and and from there they were like, all right, back to the back to the drawing board. Let's let's you know look for other spots. So we kind of found this other spot on um, on Eldridge, and I feel like we kind of rushed into it just because we still had like the whole the excitement from the other place. Still, yeah. we were like anxious to get a spot, so we kind of rushed into it. And you know, at that time is when I started working at town as well, and yeah. I just said, I got to make a decision. I can't I can't do both. I was at the bar till two, three in the morning, four in the morning, and then waking up to, to work real estate. Yeah, that's tough. Cool. Yeah, very, very tough. That's tough. Uh, was the bar, I mean, hindsight, hindsight's always twenty twenty. but would you have gotten into that bar business uh, if you were to do it again? <laughs> no, I'd probably be a state trooper. No, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, you never know. It's like, you're right, hindsight's twenty twenty. Would I do it again? You know, it, I would probably do it again because, you know, I'm Sean Hughes and I make, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a repeat offender and I make a lot of mistakes and I don't, I don't mind making mistakes. Yeah. Like one thing I just, I don't mind falling on my face and I just will do it again for the embarrassment or so would I do it again? Yeah, probably. Yeah. It, taught, it taught me a lot. It What's really taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about business and it just, but yeah. Like Danielle over here wants to, uh, hey. Hey. let's just say she wants to start a bar. Like what's, yeah, what's don't do it. <laughs> uh, don't do you want to open a bar yeah what if she wants to open a bar what, what kind of advice would you give her wait you don't really want to open a bar do you uh, hypothetically <laughs> well, I just want to make sure i want to make sure if i'm talking to her i'm giving some advice but if just hypothetical i would say um choose your partners wisely mm. the biggest one because um you know we had a partner who was involved who you know kind of really it, it, it became a real struggle and, and, you know, it really should be, it really should be fun for everybody. You know, it's, it's very, it's hard work. You really got to work, work hard. And I would also say, try not to serve food because just serving alcohol is a lot easier. And a lot more profitable probably too. Well, I mean, you know, you have, your, your, your waste is just so much less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true, true. All right. Well, uh, you know, before we foray into uh, real estate itself. Sure. Do you have any uh, personal questions that you can ask, Sean? I don't even know what we've discussed. On a personal, on a personal, personal side. Level. I almost, I almost started crying. We went, oh, we went wow. deep. We went in deep. We went yeah. in. Deep. I didn't know how deep we'd go. 
<laughs> like, whew. The, deep, the deeper we go, the better. Uh, actually, what I, did, I, did, uh, I did 15 podcasts this morning and I didn't cry in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. So you were opening this bar before you were at Town Residential, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and my license was with Brown Harris Stevens. I was, I was the only rookie broker ever that they signed. But was there anything else you were interested in doing at the time besides real estate? Like if you were to do something else after you like left the bar scene? Oh, if, if it wasn't the bar or real estate? Yeah. Um, yeah, going back to what I, you know, I know you weren't here, but I told Tak like when I was younger, I wanted to be a state trooper <laughs> in Jersey. You know, um, that was that was pretty much it. And well, then I also acted for a while. So yeah, there were there were like quite a few things. So I was kind of I was kind of all over the place, but you know, they all kind of they all kind of linked together. I feel like to, to where I am now in my life. So I think it is important that I did. I I really had a lot of fun portions of my life that kind of brought me to where I am today. Good. Um, going back to just kind of switching topics, you know, before you bought your bar, you were actually at, uh, you were actually at Brown Hair Stevens or while you bought your bar, right? Uh, yeah, I believe I was still with them. Yeah, I was still with them. How did you end up joining them? So while I was at the restaurant, my friend, I don't know if you've heard of Wilbur Gonzalez, Yes, uh, he was. You know, he was a very big broker. Uh, he did pretty much all new development. He was very high end retail, and he worked with uh, Wendy Maitland. And Adam. Uh, what's Taylor. that? Adam Taylor. Oh, that was much later. Uh, later, okay. That was that was at town. Yeah. Um, but he also worked with Reed Price. Yep. Uh, and they had ID Marketing. Right. ID Marketing was an amazing brand that kind of did very high end residential in a time when, when new development was booming. Mm -hmm. You know, one York Street, uh, one Madison, you know, 33 Best Street, all these buildings that I kind of looked at. Oh, well, go, let me, sorry, let me get back to that. So going back to how I got into it, Wilbur said, you really should get into this. You can talk to everybody and you know a lot of people. And I never really translated that into, hey, I could sell a house to them or sell an apartment to them. So I just kind of would always push it off. And then one day I said, you know what? I kind of want to learn this. I don't want to just go into it blindly. So I asked Wilbur, he said, talk to Wendy. So Wendy said, you know, do you want to drive around with me? And at the time I was like, you know, not scraping pennies, but you know, you're, you're opening a bar. I was like, yeah, I'll earn extra money. I was, I ended up driving her around. Nice. Supercharged Range Rover. So I was like, I took it, I took, took the car at night anyway. I would drive around a Range Rover and drive her and drive her, you know, very high end clients. So I kind of went from zero to 60. I went from doing absolutely no real estate to knowing anything. You were driving uh, Jimmy Kimmel around, no? I, well, I don't want to name names, do I? <laughs> we, we, had some, we had some pretty, you know, it's Wendy's clientele. So I don't want to name names, but we had, some really right. cool, we had some really cool clients. Yeah, I bet. I bet. And I really just kind of got thrown into it. And I would wear my Yankees hat pulled down and I would pick her up. And as we were doing this, I was like this, I wasn't that young, but I felt so young. I mean, I'm almost 44. So you know, I felt so, like, I felt like a little kid, like learning this whole process. I remember Reed, when I had, when I finally got my license, she said, no, Reed, Sean's starting out. And Reed's like, really? All right, you're ready to hop on this roller coaster? Wow. And I never knew that, like, the roller coaster I really was about to hop on, because real right. estate, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's insane. Well, ignorance is a bliss, you know? It's, it's sometimes it, you're it's a bliss. Yeah. So yeah. Nice to not know the things that you, you don't really want to know. Otherwise, you wouldn't have yeah. done it. And it was this amazing, amazing part of my life, like this process where like, I'd meet Wendy every night. I would leave her and she'd say, What time tomorrow? Someday she'd say, Come in at 11, meet me at the office, come in at you know, 7 a.m. and we'd meet this person. Or like it was just, you know, such a cool, such a cool time, like in my life to really kind of learn like all different. And, you know, I would do everything for her. I was basically a gopher. You know, I drive out to the Hamptons with her and I didn't care because I was learning. Right. It's like, such a, you know, and I really took advantage of it. Right. You know, just saying like, oh, I'm just driving her around. I sat there and like, I took everything in the way she would talk to people and the way, you know, she would look at a different property and show them or, you know, it just, it was really, it was, it was really, an experience that I got to take advantage of. Now, what 
would you say she was your first mentor in real estate? Yes. Yeah. For sure. hundred yeah. percent. I owe, I owe that to her hands down. And, right. and, you know, and she was, and she was great at it because a lot of people don't really have the time or they'll take you under their wing for you know, a couple of months and be like, all right, this person's annoying, but she really looked after, looked after me, you know, almost like really like family. Right. Right. But she was, she was good to me. She was good. And she was good to a lot of people. She really was. And, and then when you, when you decided to move to town, what was that transition like? Did you know, I mean, you must have known probably a year before that town was. Yeah. You know, yeah. Not yeah. Because I, I, at Brown Harris, when I was still running around with Wendy, there was a building on the Upper East Side that I got the opportunity to basically sell. So I, my friends, I just basically pitched it and, and Brown Harris, I ended up selling you know, three contracts, I think it was totaling like $15 million mm -hmm. just by talking to people. So when, when Brown Harris, you know, when Wendy left Brown Harris to go to town, you know, I kept seeing her and Andrew Heiberger having these meetings and, and this was going on for a long time and nobody knew what was unraveling. You, did you know initially or no? Of course. Well, you know, Wendy, you know, we would talk like family. Okay. So she was telling me the whole plan and what was, what was happening and it was, it, she said, you know, you're about to see something very, very, very special unravel in the next, in the next year to year and a half. And I, right. I kind of watched this progress. And she said, you know, you really have to switch your license to town. I'm not going to be, you know, a real estate agent necessarily. I'm going to be a manager, but you have to come over. So I still kind of wasn't taking it as serious. And then when she, when I walked into the town office, if you remember Matt Van Dam. Van Dam. Matt Van Dam. Yep, and I walked in the office, and I'm like, man, this is this place is pretty cool. And you know what? Just you know what's funny? That office that you're talking about, we are in the exact, we are sitting in the exact location of that office that you were talking about. What floor are you on? Six? Three. One on uh, three. Yeah, but yeah. Six, six will be the yeah. exact. Floor. We are actually yeah. in the exact building. Yeah, sixth floor, 110 Fifth Avenue. I met, I think it was like December 22nd. It was snow on the ground. I walked down from my apartment, like, and, and Matt was like, come on, let's take a tour. I walked around the office and uh, I just said, man, this is like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come over. And I, as I went over the to town, I remember meeting Robert DeVoren. Okay. Who, you know, still, a, hotel, still a very good friend of mine. And he started talking about, uh, this is about a week after. He sat in Wendy's office and he said, yeah, you know, uh, I got this commercial deal. It's a five cap. It's amazing. It's a rent roll. And I just kept saying, oh, that's amazing. It sounds like a great investment. I had absolutely no idea what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> I lied the entire time. I don't know what a five cap was. I, I had no idea what he was talking about because it was all commercial, which you know that I love commercial now. So that was also fun. And Robert's still a good friend. And I still tell him the story. Like, dude, I had no idea what you were saying. Um, but he's like, wow, you were pretty good at BSing the entire time because I thought you had, you knew everything that I was talking about. This cool. This is all you. Yeah, it was it was cool. It was fun. It was fun. You fake it till you make it. So, yeah. were you the first agent at town? That's you know, people argue that I wasn't Brett. Some Brett uh, no, Brett Solomon says oh, he. Oh, oh Solomon does that. Yeah, he always says that. That's right. Yeah, that's he right. also says he was the king of Murray Hill. Which I mean, come on, that's no. But but uh, he, I think it was either me or him, or you know, it was like me, we, him, Lucas Nathan, Dana Power, and it was it was people would come in and we kind of stare at each other, and all yeah. of a sudden these, these these stories that we were working, you know, things we were working on, which at that time was nothing for me. I was trying my best. People would just kind of look at each other and try to like you know trade stories about what you were doing and doing that it was like this organic feeling that was going out of town that people were like hey i could grow my business but i could grow it with these other people you didn't have that like that that competitive nature that's necessarily in an office that that uh is there you know it was just a different feeling and i think i don't know i forgot when you got there i was i was the seventh agent but you know what i'm talking about things were different there 100%. everybody when you would go on a showing every single other broker from different firms would all be like, wow, everybody we're meeting from town is saying it's just this experience that, that we just are hearing about. Right. And of course, they were signing on every major broker. They were giving us breakfast. They were giving us lunch. They were giving us dinner sometimes. Amazing. It was, different, yeah, it was a different time. It was, it was, yeah. uh, 
you know what they say you know they say oh the, they say all oh, the good old days so like all the good old days you know it, it's hard to identify the good old days when it's happening right now so you know yeah. you would always wish oh man i wish i really cherished more of those days back when town first opened you kind of took it for granted because you know andrew you know he he did he did treat us you know with he treated us well he wanted to spoil his agents oh yeah it was such a, was such a new you know it was a new baby and four equities and they were they were trying to like mesh together to like really put something out there that was brand new and yeah it worked, it worked for a very long time hence why i went down with the ship up until the very last day right you were you were you were loyal to the very very end oh, and, and it hurt it hurt Oh, I bet. No, I, I, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I remember uh, so, so, some funny stories of, of you and I. We were at, uh, we were at uh, Andrew took us to uh, PhD when it first opened, the club yeah. upstairs. And it, the music was super loud. And I, he, Andrew had bottles, bottle service. He had tables. Yeah. Uh, that, that kid Kyle would just pour shots, that shots after shots after shot. And you would uh, look at me with like. I the, Kyle was like a real, yeah, yeah, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle. Yeah, like that was, I thought that was a dream. Yes. Kyle was there. It was not his dream. You were yeah, I don't know what was going on. Yeah, it was like, yes. Different, those, different were, time. those were, to me, you know, for, very formidable years with Martin Newman, Brett yeah. Solomon, Ty, Kat, Chris Kastner, Adam Taylor, you know, all those guys. Uh, very formidable years for me because I was still learning the business. I didn't know anything. You know, Danielle Zakaria, Jordan Hummel, I mean, those people that we surrounded ourselves with was so fun. And I don't think I've ever partied. It was like college 2.0 for me. I mean, we, we, I don't think we've ever partied so hard while working together. Did all night, did for sure. Yeah. That was pretty kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you still do. Uh, no, not as much. Yeah. Enough. Not That's as true. much. But and, uh, it was nuts. It was nuts. So let's so fast forward, you know, the, the last, I know you were very, very loyal to the end, you know. What were some of your accomplishments, during, you know, up until that time before you decided that uh, it, it was time to switch. And what have you done that you're comfortable talking about? Well, I became a state trooper. That's it. No, <laughs> kidding. Um, so I worked, so I got to work with, you know, my business partner up until very recently, uh, which we're still, you know, very, you know. Great guy, great guy. I mean, like. as, as like my family, you know, I love him and really got to work with somebody who, who I thought after working with Wendy, there, there could be nobody else I can work with. And I got to work with Ayeen literally by asking him a couple of questions to pick his brain about a townhouse deal I was working on. Um, and, you know, again, naive, you know, I had this client who I was showing rentals to and was working with United American Land on 53 Howard. And I was doing these leases and all of a sudden my client ended up buying, like, you know, I think I had like two or three contracts with him at once and I had no idea what I was doing. And I was like, I think I asked him, you know, you know, well, you have to pay my fee. And I was like, I didn't realize the seller paid the fee. I mean, this is embarrassing to say, but let's put it out. Let's put it out there. Uh, you know, and he told me like, no, no, the seller pays you. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> you know? But he's also a very good friend of mine. So kind of like, you know, it just shows you that the people that you're loyal to, like, you know, you work hard, you're loyal, you know, they kind of, they can kind of get your back, you know? It just, and, shows, it just proves that people work with the people that they, they like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah even if they ask stupid questions sometimes and I asked a lot of them but with Ayeen I asked him questions and I remember it was like a late spring afternoon and we were on top of 750 Greenwich it was like the first townhouse I sold in the West Village and uh and we were negotiating it we were on top of the roof trying to like you know see see like the location and, you know the townhouse on the corner and I was like man this is awesome like it's a beautiful you know it was, it's warm out I'm hanging out this is work and I'm going to get paid for this. This is like, okay, I'm in, you know, and that's, that was like the time when I feel like the transition, like I was already full time, but like the real transition started of like, this is, this is, you know, this is what I'm doing now. This is great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I really feel like that. I really feel like that, that we get to have a job where we get to be out there and be our own bosses and, and kind of take on like and work as hard as we want to work. Or as little as we want, but you know we're kind of in charge of what we're doing. And and, and in your case, I mean, you're twenty. You know, you you and I, we were. I remember at town, we were. You know, we were first ones in the office, last ones out. I mean, you would come in at ten o'clock sometimes. I would still be there. Yeah, yeah, but you'd leave earlier. You were kind of getting lazy. Um, and that's <laughs> I could say that now, right? He's getting a little. 
You'd be there at like two in the morning sometimes. But remember, right. we, I'd have the conference call screaming. Yes, yes. I still do that in my house. I had a conference call yesterday and, my, and I, was, I was like, dude, come on. And Elsa, my daughter, three years old, was screaming in the back, dude, come on. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so it still happens, it still happens. But, um, but yeah, it's... If you could go back to your uh, 20, 20, 30, 32, 33 year old self at town, right? So 30 year self at town? Uh, yeah. Yeah, still kind of establishing yourself to become full time, having relatively good early success. What would you tell your What would you tell your your, your early early thirties self as far as advice is concerned? Hmm. For real estate or just in general? Uh, let, let's do both. What professional and personal? Uh, you for personal? Personal and professional, both. Uh, I don't even know if I have to think about that. I mean, I feel like I feel like that was a time of my life up until now where I've made some like some pretty good choices. Mm -hmm. You know, I think before that there were a lot of choices that I kind of wish. You know, people say oh, I have no regrets. I have a ton of them. <laughs> you know, I don't know if like you know if you do or not. I, we all do. I feel like I, feel like I have regrets, um, but but I do, and I think about them all the time. You know, I think about them all the time because uh, I feel like it helps me learn. I feel like every day, the more I, the more I think about those regrets you know, thinking about that regret, and I, I really do, I think about them almost every day because okay. it helps me stay clear and stay focused. So I feel like maybe the advice would be, you know, when you, when you really have, well, I guess, I guess a piece of advice would be, you know, don't get so emotional about your deals. And that's something which I'm still telling myself. You do, you do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I have high blood pressure because every time you talk about your deals, your, the, the, the feeling, the passion, the energy, every time you talk about any deal, I can always feel it. Yeah, I love it. I absolutely, you know, I get a high from it. You know, and when I, there are days when I don't, like, I don't know if you have these days when you have a day of like, it's quiet. Yeah. You know, and for me, sometimes those days, like now it's different because I have kids, but sometimes those days I find myself like getting down. Mm. Not, not bad, where I'm like, you know, sulking in the corner. But then I find myself, I get the phone call again. Somebody wants to see something or, and it, it's like, gives me this high. So, you know, and I feed off of that. Right. Because I, I, I love doing it. So I think I would tell myself then and still telling myself, you know, don't get so emotional because, you know, your job again is to, is to sort of be level-headed because if, you know, being emotional about it is, it could be, it could be tiresome. Right. Yeah. You don't want, you don't want an advocate that's, going to be more emotional emotional than the client yeah oh yeah yeah and a lot of times i won't show it to them but i still you know lose my mind on deals and and you know i tell myself that's not going to happen again and, 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 and then three days later i'm doing it all over again mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. uh so switching gears now uh now we're going to talk about my hair, my hair is still good talk what do you, how's the hair it's looking fresh thank you so much it's good. It's growing out. It's growing out. Are you gonna grow it out? Um, I feel like if I grow like a ponytail, ponytail, keep this short. I feel like things are really gonna come around for me back, you know, in my life. As long as Nikki's okay with it, you know, why not? She, she, my wife actually wouldn't care. She doesn't care about anything. She's she's, she's so you know, she's so chill. I I, I miss yeah, I miss working. I miss working with Nikki back when uh, she used to work for the Madison Square Park Conservatory. And we used and, to, we used to volunteer. You and I, we used to volunteer the Halloween. It's right around this time of the year. Those bring, you back, bring you back some memories. Yeah, bring that. I, I remember I did that for a few years with her. It was fun. It was a good time. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. We were dating, and I lived at an apartment in 29th Street, and we walked to the office. Yeah, you bring back memories. Very formidable years. Uh, now, when did you decide you were going to join Compass? What, what were some of the catalysts that happened when, uh, you know, what, what, actually, let's go back. What were some of the last few months of town like? You know, I, I, know that, I know that the office was kind of different. Yeah, I actually started uh, not going to the office. Yeah, I, I think that actually started me not going to the office as much because, you know, I don't, I'm not into uh, gossip. And I'm not into all that, you know, that the negativity that people are kind of bringing out it was kind of really frustrating to stay focused sure. and, and then and then taking that and then you know brokers talk you know as you know real estate agents everybody talks and, and that gets around to clients and then 
you know, for, for me to take that. I felt like for me, it was better to not hear it and just sort of have my own opinion to tell my clients my version of it, as opposed to sort of, you know, hearing the negativity. I just wasn't about it. And, and for me, I being because I am, you know, I am a very loyal person. And wherever I'm working with, you know, I have, I really have their back. And I was with town till the end. So, so because of that, when companies were calling up all the time, you know, my answer was, listen, I'm with town and, and uh, I'm fine. We're good. And that was it. And I basically said that until the end. Even when companies uh, were calling you, I remember. Absolutely. All yeah. the time, all the time. And, and, um, you know, Rob, Rob Rufkin was, was calling me since the earlier days and, you know, I would have, if I wasn't the way I was, where I'm loyal to a company, yeah, Compass, Compass was always very, you know, it, it just was a brand that I loved to, to. Sean, what was happening on the other end was me knocking on Refkin's door, Gordon's door, oh, Hank's no. door, and saying, this guy, Sean, he's great. He's the best. I know, I know. and Rob would, he would probably tell me that, but, you know, I'm loyal. And, and you know, I, I just wasn't ready to, to make the leap, but I, I found that. You know, when, when it finally happened, it, it was, a, it was a tough day. I remember I wasn't home. I wasn't uh, at the office. I was home and just had got, I got home and, and I uh, got a phone call and they were like, yeah, town's closing. You know, and the way it happened was, was pretty rough. The way it landed on the agent's laps. It, was, it, was it came like rough. this. It wasn't like a, we knew it was yeah. going to close eventually. No, it was like one day lights out. Yeah, and there, yeah, it was it was um, it was a lot to handle for us because then we we sort of had, you know, we were basically I don't want to say jobless, we still had a job, but you basically then had to go out sort of ill prepared, and then go on these interviews. I remember being on interviews that night. And I think we closed. I got back to the office around I don't know, six o'clock, five or six o'clock, and uh, you know my business, you know, I was packing up his boxes and I was packing up my stuff and bringing stuff down to the cars and. And from there, we started going on interviews. Like even thinking back to that, like it's, it was just a bizarre time. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're being so, forced to change. Even though you were loyal, you didn't have to no change. Yeah, yeah not, to sound, not to sound like a baby, but you know, you, you, like, there is an emotional part to it. You know, you're with this company since the beginning. And then you start getting, at least for me, I'm a very nostalgic person. So I was getting nostalgic about the beginning days of town. Oh, and yeah. sort of like mo almost mourning, you know, this, this whole thing. And then on top of that, Everybody around you is asking you what happened, what happened, what happened. So you got to tell them, and then you're interviewing, and then there's like so many things. I remember being home and just saying, you know what, I'm going to shut down for two weeks, and I don't want to make any decision. And we just kept interviewing, but Compass was already kind of the the clear choice for me, um, just for a lot of different reasons. I'm like, yeah, that, that's that's the choice, but I need time just to kind of absorb everything. And, uh, and that was it. And I told Paige, uh, the recruiter who, you know, I said, Paige, just give us a little time. I, and, you know, she was like freaking out. She thought, I said, we're not going anywhere else. She was freaking out because she said, you're, you're going out someplace else. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I promise you, I don't go back to my word. If I tell you I'm with you, I'm with you. And then, you know, started up with uh, a couple of weeks later after everything kind of uh, settled, you know, the dust settled a little bit. Did you talk to uh, Andrew Heiberger at all? Did you have any parting words with him before you left or? Uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of the, the talk was mostly about, um, you know, I don't want to get into it too much. I, you know, I, I, hate, I hate even talking about it because I think a lot of people have their, their opinions and, and what really happened. But, you know, there was, we, had, we had deals that needed to be closed still. So I think a lot, of, a lot of the parts of us talking to him was about actual business. Right. Remember, Deals were left, lots of deals out, out there. Yeah, and I wasn't that broker who was going to say, "Hey, I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to leave you." I was there till the end. So because of that, that was also a very big part of like having to figure out, okay, how's what's the best way, you know? And, and at that time, um, I, I think I had my how, how long ago was that for? Yeah, so I had my daughter. Yeah, married with my daughter. So at that at that point, I'm like, you know, I got to figure out how do I get you know, I have a family to provide for. Sure. Yeah. And you were still living in um, Jersey City then? Yes. Yeah. 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 I remember just like this feeling of this sucks. Like it was just, I was like, felt so disgusted. Mm -hmm. And like, I felt like disgusting. Right. I felt stupid. I felt part of me was like, hey, you know, like 
I waited this long. And, oh, man, like, what if, you know, you always play like the whole the scenario runs through your mind. Like, oh, I should have done this. I could have done this and I could have left earlier and you play like all these different scenarios. And it just felt so, you know, it felt terrible. Right. It really did. Yeah, no, I, I, I can understand that. I can see that. Um, say did I talk to you right after that? I'm sorry? Did I talk to you after that whole thing happened? Right yeah. after? You were talking the night you were like, go. Danielle and I were bowling in Brooklyn and you and I were still going back and forth. You remember that night? Oh, that's right. Yes, that's right. Sorry for not recalling that. <laughs> no, I was one of 200 other text messages that you probably had that night. But no, I, I, I actually do now remember just talking to you because you were talking to me leading up to that the whole time. So. We were talking about your offer. We were talking about if it was fair, how it sounded. We were, you know, I was talking to Paige too a lot. I was behind her ear because I really wanted to be an advocate for you. Yep. Uh, and in being one of the more important people or the most important person to come out of you know town because it's not like Compass was accepting everybody from town. Oh yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. They, you yeah. know, a lot, of, a lot of people went elsewhere. Sure, yeah, exactly. And then there, there were some Repkin wanted some people that, that didn't come, and you know, there was a whole thing. So we, I just wanted to make. I knew a lot of people there, but I wanted to make sure you were one of the you know main targets. And I was um, definitely Paige did a you know Paige did a good job staying on top of you, but also we were talking because we want. I wanted to make sure that you were being treated well or fairly at least during this during a crazy transition period. No, the, the, pro the process was actually, you know, she made it, she made it really as, as painless as possible. There you go, shout out Paige Donnelly. She helped alleviate, what's that? The shout out to Paige Donnelly for that. <laughs> yeah, no, well, she helped to alleviate a lot of like the, you know, the worrying and like, you know, they, it, was, it was an easier process, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, well, let, let, let's switch gears a little bit. We like to call it a little pivot, a little pivot. Yeah, another four hours of this, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Dinner now. You, you, Danielle's a Jersey girl. Where are you from in Jersey? I'm from Hopewell, New Jersey, by Princeton. Oh, I hate New Jersey. I'm not really from there, just for the podcast. I'm just He's trying from, to make it real. He's from Hackensack. Uh, so, you know, it's in the same state. Different. Is like, what, what county is that? Mercer. Oh, Mercer. That's a whole. So, wait. So, Hope, Hopewell? Yeah. It's so north. I get a text message on my phone from the Hopewell. Sorry, Top. From the Hopewell Moose Lodge, and I have no idea how I get a text message from the Hopewell, Hopewell Moose. Have you ever heard of the Hopewell Moose Lodge? No. Well, if you're going to go back, I would join it. I think it's 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 mainly for men in their fifties and sixties that go for like a two go for like two dollar beers that they could smoke inside and just like get away from their yeah, wife. The Hopewell. So so how you're in Mercer County? So are you close to like Allentown, New Jersey? Yeah, that's pretty close. That's where my cousin lives. So it's very, very rural, right? Only like 35 minutes from, from us, yeah. Oh, so you're not that far from where I live now, Red Bank. So it's probably like straight across because we're on the, the uh, west side. Got it. So 195 west. Yeah. Nice. You still go home a lot? Yeah. Usually like once or twice a month. Huck, have you been there? Princeton? No. No. Hopewell. Hopewell, no. I have not. Oh. If you want to meet up at the Hopewell Moose Lodge, I get text messages all the time. Yeah, we should. Yeah, we should. I'm sure it, it probably looks like an abandoned post office, and then you walk in with a camera, and it's all like old men smoking cigarettes inside. We're we gonna have a grand, yeah. grand old time. <laughs> grand old time. Uh, so, so, so you're at Compass. You got your uh, New Jersey license. You're basically one of the first agents at Compass to get their New Jersey license. When you joined, you already lived in New Jersey City. You had already done a couple deals yourself in Jersey City. And now you're by the shore, correct? Yeah, you know I'm not with Compass New Jersey, right? I know, I know. That's okay. So well, you are one of the first agents at Compass that- yes. there's a very, a very specific reason why that is not the case. I would 1000% be with Compass New Jersey. I actually had my license with them for a very short period. Uh -huh. And I have a development down in Monmouth County in Red, on the Red Bank Middletown border. Well, that is? The developer, the developer just felt like you know, Compass did not have, which is normal. I mean, they're brand new in the state. Yeah. And you know, obviously, Compass moves extremely fast, and, and they're going to have a presence down here more. But he just felt like they didn't have the actual presence down here yet. Um, once that happens, obviously, there'll be you know, maybe a transition period. But for now, the development that I'm working on, it really needed a strong presence, and, and so that's why I signed with uh, Coldwell Banker. Got it. Here, so Compass New York. So to tell us about the, the, the development. I mean, what, what is it? What is it about? Uh, how did it get started? When, when, when it started? 
funny, it's with, uh, it's with Burke Development, BDA, who they have, you know, they've done about 30 homes in Monmouth County. Uh, really beautiful high-end you know, houses that, um, you know, I met the builder's father just randomly at a property and uh, his son had called while he was there. So I started talking to his son about real estate and uh, who owns the company. And he lives in Manhattan, but has a beach house in Monmouth Beach, New Jersey. And we kind of just meshed and he said, why don't you come see this property I'm working on and walk this property. And from there, just kind of form this relationship. And, uh, and now we're, you know, I'm selling it. It's, it's nine, you know, beautiful, you know, lots of land that start at over an acre uh, with, you know, 3,100 to, to 7,000 square foot houses and they're on Shadow Lake. So it's kind of like a, a, a hidden enclave that people don't really, that they don't fully know about and hopefully this can help. How but, far away uh, from the beach is it? So it's only about four or five miles from the beach, okay. from, right? And it's you know a block, basically a, a, a long block away from the Garden State Parkway, so you get to Manhattan, you know, in less than an hour. Okay. Uh, the train runs through right through Red Bank to Penn Station. You have the C Street Ferry, so just the the way to get to the city, the access is great. And I think you know, with unfortunately with the with the way the pandemic is going, a lot of people are moving out of New York, um, which I know you probably do not like, which, which um, but it just is sort of the case right now. This is a this is a fact, and it's not a fact that we're necessarily shying away or running away from. They yeah. know full well, based yep. on all the listings that we have, we have them because a lot of people are moving out. A lot of people are moving out, so you know we are seeing a lot of action. A lot of New York buyers coming down who are looking for more space, and because of the transition with with the pandemic, people are now working from home. You know, hence I'm in this office right now that we transitioned from a bedroom to an office, and people are really are looking for space you know, who have kids and who want to sort of, uh, you know, now I think people are shying away from having these, these large houses and these large you know, plots of land. And now they're kind of going back to that. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's sort of a time in the market where we want to kind of capitalize on that. And, you know, that's why we're trying to sell it. So like our first, our, we have one sold, one under contract, another contract out. So we basically have six more homes to go. And the price point starts at, um, for that house is 1.6 million. I think it was up to seven nine nine. Seven nine nine. The one for eight million is uh, you know a seven thousand square foot house for five a dime. Little seller. It was about fifteen million dollars, twenty million dollars. Yeah, even or or it could be more because with upgrades the contract prices tend to go up. Um, but if you don't do one upgrade, the contract price can be the same, and the house will be turnkey, amazing. What does the new new development landscape look like out in Mount Ma Ma Mammoth, New Jersey? Mount Monmouth County. So, there are some other, so it's, funny, it's funny you ask that because the new developments that we see, like there's a Toll Brothers project. And listen, I've sold Toll Brothers in Brooklyn, other areas, but the comparison is just different. You know, Toll Brothers tends to build, you know, they have a quick deliver house where one house is ready to go. Somebody else gets maybe uh, a different kitchen finish. But if you go to your neighbor's house, chances are they may have a very similar floor plan. These are very different. You, know, you, really, you really customize your home. Mm -hmm. So if you want to switch the interior, you know, you, you really have the opportunity to kind of create your, your own home within this enclave. Right. I just feel like the suburbs, you know, the, the discerning buyer typically don't have as many options as they want because everything. So here's the interesting part about this, about this plot of land as well. You know, my wife and I, when we moved to Red Bank, we were not looking to move. My brother said, come, come see this one house, yeah. which is the house I'm in now. Yeah. And, you know, we, we love this house and, and, you know, we, Red Bank is a town that it's diverse. There's a whole downtown area, bars, restaurants. And from my house, I could walk, take the kids on the bikes. From Hiddenwell, which is the name of the development, you could do the same thing. It's within walking distance to downtown Red Bank. So right. there's a sense of, you know, yeah, it might be close to a suburb, but there's a sense of having your big house on a big piece of land and still able to go to a downtown area. And that's, that's hard to capture um, in, in a lot of other areas of New Jersey, even Monmouth County. And after this one's done, there really isn't much like it that exists, that it's on a lake. Right. You know, it's amazing. You, you know, you have a, so a couple of the houses have their own private docks. So that, that's, it's, it's gonna be very difficult to copy that if, if at all, if any builder will be able to do that in Monmouth County again. Uh, how's the fishing in the lake? Amazing. People are fishing. You, so there are no, no motors on the, on the lake. Okay. Either 
totally. Either, uh, yeah, it's fishing, kayaking. Yeah. Uh, you know, for some people swim. So it's very, very quiet lake. Does it, it does not feed out into any other body of water. Danielle, what else do you need to know about this project for you to want to, you know, to be sold on it? I'm basically sold already. <laughs> <laughs> but really, if you have, buy, if you ever have, because we are getting so much traffic from up north. From New York. So we are, from even from Jersey City, Hoboken, Manhattan. You know, we're seeing a lot of people just wanting to have an extra, either an extra house or just their main house. So really, the, really, we want to get the word out to, to need the New York market. So there's no doubt, and it is a fact, and it's been written that the accidental benefactors of COVID 19 is essentially you, your market. Westchester, Connecticut, Maine, Vermont, Long Island. Well, a lot well, of you're in, you're in Tribeca and you have a you know a two bed two bath at you know two point two million, or you come down to uh, Hidden Well with you know a, a, you're in a you're in a private enclave with a customizable house for five thousand square feet in for two point two million as well. People are now seeing the upside because they're like, look, if I'm if I don't have to be in my office, I can work from my own house. I need space. And you can come in once or twice a week still in the Manhattan, and it won't be a backbreaker because you're not doing the commute every day. Yeah, or you could just drive, like right now I drive in in less than an hour, or I could hop on the C Street, which is running less frequently now, but you can hop on the boat. There are just ways to go that it's very, very easy. And I, and I actually think that's going to stay that way for a long time. I think so too. I, 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 I can really do. I think that's, it's, when I have showings in New York now, I just, I fly in, I come right back out. It's very, very easy. You fly in with your, uh, your with your uh, PJ, your, your private jet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, pri my private jet. That was part of the compass deal. <laughs> when you you drive in with your bicycle how cool is that yes yeah, so i have yeah my pickup truck with the bike in the back i have a whole thing <laughs> so you literally drive in and you bike around the city and then you drive back out i drive back do my showings i drive back i put my bike back in the pickup close it up drive back home okay all right it's a great way to, a great way to travel so to just just to recap you know for, for those listening and are interested in this new development project in new jersey uh, reach out to Sean. I'll plug his contact information. I'll plug his social media in the bio of this, of this podcast episode so you guys can all uh, see what he's talking about for reference. Sean, you can also make sure. Hidden Well Estates NJ, hiddenwellestates.nj.com. Hiddenwellestates.nj.com. So you heard it here first, uh, or you heard it here first on a podcast platform. Uh, Danielle, do you have any questions that you want to ask Sean? Uh, you know, just about his life, business. Personal? Yeah, how did the transition go for you from, you started out obviously in Manhattan doing real estate, but yep. then moved and lived in Jersey City. So how did that go for you from transitioning to starting to dabble in New Jersey? It's much different. It's a whole different animal. I had to learn it. I nowhere, there's complete, you know, you go into New Jersey with the whole mind frame of Manhattan, even the way like you send a deal sheet out, you know, here, everything's different. You know, you send out a contract to purchase and you go into a attorney review, like things are just, everything done in Manhattan is complete opposite in Jersey. So <laughs> it's, it was, it was challenging at first. Uh, and then, you know, after a while you become comfortable, but it took me a while. It took me a while. And, you know, even, even, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, I've had my license now in Jersey for a good four or five years. I just didn't utilize it. So I'm still kind of learning it. Um, and, you know, still doing my New York business. And now I find that I'm just kind of all over the place and busy because I still have my New York business and Jersey business. So it's, it's been a little crazy. Busy, busy time. Uh, are you going to be starting up a, a new team on your own now, now that you're uh, officially independent? Uh, yeah, there is one other person on my team and I think two others will be coming on. So, you know, We'll be forming the Hughes group most likely, but you know. And would that team be more focused in New Jersey or uh, in Manhattan? No, New Jersey. Well, no, Manhattan. I'll always do on my own with Compass. Okay. So, but 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 New Jersey will just be you know will be the group with Coldwell. Will be just Jersey. Okay. Good. Different areas. North, North Jersey. Uh, to your uh, to to what? your standards. Yeah. Good. <laughs> did you uh did you have a mentor or anyone that like helped you in new jersey when you like were getting no, kind of i kind of learned you know, i mean i've been doing it long enough i think in new york that i kind of just knew like what to do just you know asking a lot of the same questions you know just just for some of the logistics of it that was that was pretty much it just kind of figuring out the the stuff that i don't like doing which is the administration stuff which i'm absolutely horrible at right right yeah you're very good at 
Your job is to build and sell, not to uh, not to perform arts and crafts. Yeah, but I but I find that stuff very very difficult. Yeah, the, the things I told you before, the whole dyslexia never really helps. Right. Okay. So. Uh, well, listen, I, I really appreciate your time here and uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, are, are there any closing uh, things that you want to note or state or mention? No, what time am I doing this tomorrow? I want to do this every day now of my life. You know, what's going to be great about this, Sean, is your kids are going to grow up. Elsa, Kai, just going to grow up to be these wonderful adults in their, in their late teens and early 20s. And they're going to find out what Spotify is. And then they're gonna be, they're gonna look up, they're gonna type in your, your dad's, they're gonna type in their dad's name, Sean Hughes. And then the Real Talk podcast is gonna pop up. That's right. And, and they'll be like, oh my God, dad. You know, it's such a funny time now with the pandemic going on. Like yesterday I was working and I said, you know, my wife, like we're trying to balance things. I'll take the kids from like, you know, 12 to three and, and, and I'll drive the kids around while I'm on conference calls. And like, you know, it's just such an interesting time for even young kids, like my daughter, figures out she has her own little mask and my one-year-old probably is like what the hell's going on a quarter of his life is spent in lockdown but you know what it's it's a great time to spend with my kids it's awesome it's fun yesterday it's I, awesome. I, I was working yesterday on calls i knew i had like back-to-back -back call that lined up so i said you know i'm gonna drive to lambertville pennsylvania or no uh, lambertville new jersey so i drove there that's actually close to not far from where you yeah, yeah. yeah. So I drove there while we were on conference calls, took my kids antique shopping. And they were oh. playing, like all the little toys. Okay. And then hopped back out, took them for dinner, and then uh, and then drove home. So it's kind of like a, you know, it's a, it's a, like a kind of a neat time because you get to nice little life. You get to work, but also kind of you know spend spend more time with your family. So yeah, no, absolutely, no, that's great, that's great. Uh, listen, Sean, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, for you, for those of you guys that want to follow Sean, you can't because he doesn't really have a digital footprint. Uh, you can always reach out to him. I joined Instagram like 10, uh, no, about a year ago. And yes. I, I want to thank all of my 300 followers. 300, follow. 300 followers. I, I just, about not real estate, but his, his beautiful family and his beautiful community. I'll, I'll change that. I actually need your help with that. I, I need to focus on social media. We can talk about that too, for sure. Uh, but listen, Sean, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Let's hang out soon when you come back to the city. Let's grab a drink or go out for a bite or something like that. And I'm sure Danielle will love to join you. She loves, she likes you as well. So we will. Uh, yes, yeah, let's Hopewell Moose Lodge until then. Hopewell Moose yes. Lodge. We're going to go smoke some cigarettes and drink some beers in a dark room with some old men at Hopewell Moose Lodge. Uh, <laughs> but Sean, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, guys. Sorry it took so long for you to get here, but thank you. Thank you all for listening. Talk to you all soon. Bye, guys. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you.